Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jenna Quinn, and it's my pleasure as the Assistant Director of Alumni and Affinity Engagement to welcome you all to this edition of the 49er Industry Chat. Um, and so just so everyone knows, this is session is being recorded. So what that really means for you is that this will be available to you again on demand at our website at www.csulb.edu slash alumni. So feel free to watch it again, send it to a friend or a colleague or anyone else you might think uh, could get something good out of this. Um, and so with that, I am so happy to introduce uh, our alumni host today, Krista Alarcon. Did I get that right? Yeah, Alarcon. It's, I mean, there's like a little asterisk over the O and stuff like that, but yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you so much for joining. Welcome, Krista. Uh, and uh, we're excited to have you. I just want to go ahead and read your bio so that way everyone knows uh, kind of a little bit, little bit about you before we get started. So okay. Krista, MSW, is a service-focused individual with a passion for serving the needs of underprivileged adults and adolescents, including a homeless, a homeless at risk, and other disabled populations. She has over ten years of work experience in the social services industry, including substance abuse, reentry. AB 109, parolee, and domestic violence. She graduated with both an undergrad and graduate degrees uh, from Cal State Long Beach, Go Beach. Uh, and she was born and raised in uh, East Los Angeles, where she also currently lives and works. Her passion lies beyond mental health, more towards overall well being and, and becoming the best version of ourselves in hopes of creating a brighter future. In her off time, you can find her in the gym, out in nature, or on the basketball court. She also loves to spend time with loved ones, reading and binging great TV shows, and living her own life of adventure with travel. Krista, thank you so much for being here today and welcome. Thank you, Jenna, for helping for having me. Yeah. So let's just let's just get right on into it um, and start off with with just a super basic question, um, you know, can you share a little bit about your background and what your life and experiences were like that led you to come to the beach in the first place? Yeah, for sure. So um, as I mentioned, you know, in my bio, I grew up in East Los Angeles, um, you know, as a very young, as a very young woman, my mother instilled education as a value, both in myself and my younger sisters. And as a route towards like overall success and out of poverty and the poor middle class in which my family was in. Um, and so this is like what led me to think about my future as a college student, if I wanted to go to college, um, you know, because I wanted to guarantee the best succeed, success for my future and for my family. So, you know, I focused on doing well in school, being involved in extracurriculars. As I mentioned, you know, basketball and sports were like my main thing. Um, I also was involved in like student government, you know, to boost my competitiveness in um, the application process, you know, and, um, as a first generation college student, I didn't have any experience with college planning or college applications and the process. Um, and I have relied on like word of mouth, my friends and my college planning um, counselor at school. Um, and I had to like realistically consider my chances of getting into college with like my GPA that I had and my scores on my SATs. And um, also like, you know, the distance that I am from my family because family is such an important value to me. So I didn't want to really be too far from them and the support that I had. So I chose to fo focus on local state and UC schools um, that I had. And um, Cal State Long Beach was definitely my top choice for local schools over Cal State LA or Cal State Northridge, Dominguez Hills. Um, and I was only accepted into one UC, which was UC Riverside. And 
I just thought like that was way too far for me at the time. So um, I think it was like pretty much destined and written in the stars for me to come to Cal State Long Beach. Um, and if I didn't get into any any colleges, my next option was the Air Force. That's what I had always told people. If I didn't get into college, I'm going to the Air Force. Um, so like, yeah, that's what led me to Cal State Long Beach. And I never, that was one of the best decisions I've ever had, I've ever made in my life. Honestly. Don't feel as though you missed out on the Air Force? No, I don't feel I missed out on the Air Force. Uh, maybe the benefits, because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> veteran benefits are amazing. But um, yeah, no, I never regretted my decision of going to Cal State Long Beach at all. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, with that, right, like since since you since you were so it was your number one choice and you did get in, um, you know, what was that student experience like for you? I, you talked a little bit already about being a first gen student. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what what was that like? Were were you involved in clubs or activities? Were there professors that really stood out to you, helped you along the way? You know, what, what was that like for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was very scary not knowing what to expect. Um, and really like, I was like, I just think things like work out how they're supposed to. And also I just believe that, you know, there's just things that are meant to happen for you and manifestation and law of attraction and things like that. So like while I was applying for colleges and things like that, one of my friends in high school when I was a senior at the time told me about a program called the Education Opportunity Program. And she's like, you're a first gen student, right? Like, I mean, you're low income, you know, like this is a program geared for your population, you know? And uh, I mean, she didn't put it to me like that, but she was like, hey, you should apply to this because like, you know, it's a good program and you're first gen. And I think, you know, I heard great things. So, you know, word of mouth, like, so I ended up applying for the EOP program and got accepted because of my first gen and being low income and things like that. And they offered to do a student bridge program for me. Um, you know, at no cost, like it, the whole thing was for me to get acclimated to college student, college way of life, the campus, the professors, the workload and things like that. And that had such a profound effect on my success at Cal State Long Beach. And I was like really involved in that program. I even ended up coming back and being a residential advisor for that program later on when I was a senior to give back because it was such, it was, it was an amazing, amazing opportunity. And I'm so glad that, you know, I was able to do that. And again, like things just happen, like gravitate towards you. And I really believe like that was one of the things, you know, and so during that I gained mentors, relationships with other first generation students that were like going through some of the same things that I were going through, like the struggles that we had with understanding, navigating the college process, how to pick classes, how to structure your day, you know, like, being that I, I was going to also work and live off campus for the first year. Um, and then at this time, mind you, we just experienced like a 2008 recession. So that was the time when I was, you know, so all that was also going on in my first year of college. And so, you know, um, after the first year, I decided to make my move closer to the beach and applied and started working on campus. I left my Home Depot job. <laughs> <laughs> and I applied for the ASI office, which is the student government office at Cal State Long Beach. So I worked alongside with, you know, the student body president, the treasurer, secretary, all those things. And that just like also made me feel closer to the community um, and being aware of like all the events that took place on campus and all the organizations, you know, because I was also involved in like those meetings and took minutes for those meetings where the different sororities or frats or student orgs would come to um, bring a proposal to ask for funding to hold some events for students and things like that. So um, I was able to like be involved in some of their and I worked in ASI all the way to the point where I graduated. So four years I was with um, the student body government and stuff like that. And um, 
you know, and so like back in the day, and this was when Amazon only did books, right? Like <laughs> I, I just, it just blows my mind. I'm like, dang, Amazon only did books and I would rent from Amazon. But, um, you know, how I would navigate like classes and professors in general was they had this website um, that did ratings of professors at all schools, like across the nation. It's called Rate My Professor, best like resource ever. So I would purposely like go online, look at the ratings of professors and pick my classes based on like the ratings and they were insanely accurate. So I ended up having like really great professors that like instilled passion of the subject, like we're just really down to earth that just have an overall cool vibe. And it was actually the psychology professor that provided me like the foundation that guided me to my current career of social work. Her name was Piper Mandy. Um, amazing she was so amazing the way she brought like her energy and her passion for the subject you know um and that's somebody that stood out with stood out with me for a long time I also had other professors that challenged me in other ways too like um at, you know like writing was never my strong point and so like there was this one professor who graded me really hard on a subject and I ended up having to like retake the retake the class because of it um and so like that experience just like always stood with me but it also you know revealed my character and built resilience and things like that so I'm also grateful for that experience because had she not I would have never known and I was like already in my third year at this point so and nobody ever mentioned it to me so it was like I was being I was having a disservice until this professor did you know, so I mean, that was like also like a profound experience and also like helped me clarify, like, what am I doing here? What's my goal? And, you know, what do I want in this, in this, in this situation, you know? And it just like, again, like re-motivated me, like, hey, like, this is like my goal to graduate and, you know, have a college degree and stuff like that. So, you know, it just reinstilled like all those things. Um, I also participate in like intramural sports, you know, as I mentioned, like basketball has always been like my thing. Sports have always been my thing. I still play basketball today. You know, I will never stop playing. I just love being active. And then I was like super stoked because this was before the rec center happened. And so during my time at Cal State Long Beach, they announced that they were going to have the rec center. And when it would complete it, be completed, I'm like, heck yeah, I'm still going to be here. Like, this is great, you know? <laughs> so I was in there like nearly every day, would even go on Saturdays because I was still like living in Long Beach at the time. And I lived in Long Beach, moved in Long Beach, lived in Cambodia town. Like it was one mile from the beach. Like it was amazing, you know? Um, and so I felt even closer to like the Cal State Long Beach community since I was local and could easily meet up with colleagues, friends on campus, off campus, go to events, you know? Um, it was, it just made that whole situation like way more accessible and available to me. Um, and so, yeah, so that's like part of like the club's activities, classes and the jobs that I've had on there, you know, like I've also had other great professors and things like that. I started doing meditation with one of my psych professors. He offered that, you know, as like an adjunct, you know, not like you were graded on it, but, you know, like just for some self-care stuff. And I think that's a lot, a part of it too, is like, I learned what self-care was before they even popped out with that name what self-care was you know so um yeah I know I, I honestly sounds like a great student experience and thank you so much for sharing it with us but I want to zero in on on one of the things that you had mentioned which was that you had a a professor that kind of um you know helped you find figure out that you wanted to go into social work mm -hmm. um can you talk a little bit about you know, that journey and in, in discovering that that's what you wanted to do and, you know, what you thought you would be doing, like your way into this field. What was that like? Oh, man, it was a five year journey. I was on that five year plan. <laughs> <laughs> I was not on the four year plan when I entered Cal State Long Beach. Well, when I first went to college, all I knew was being a doctor. Like I wanted I knew I wanted to help people. 
right? Like that's always been like something I wanted to do is help people. I just thought my brain only thought or like my experiences only thought like the only way I could help people was to be a doctor, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I went in as a biochem major into Cal Mm -hmm. State Long Beach because that's what I heard doctors major in when they go into undergrad right so you know and um I was really struggling not because like I couldn't do it just because like it was stressing me out and no matter how much I studied how much I stressed like I wasn't having the success that I thought I would for how many hours that I was putting in you know like I think it has to do with like the maturity of the brain I think my brain wasn't just mature enough to like take in the information um, and absorb it. Um, and so like, I ended up, I ended up struggling with changing my major because I had built relationships. I had made friendships in that major. And I knew like, once you change your major, that's another thing that, pe- that people don't tell you when you're a first gen student or are aware is like, when you are in a certain major, like you're with certain people, you know, cause you all are going in that you know, in that road or on that road and in that journey together. So I made friendships in the, in the science field that we would plan classes together, plan to take classes together, some of the same classes. So that way we would have that support, you know, when it came to studying and things like that. So I struggled with changing it because I didn't want to lose those friendships. And so, but at the same time, like I was struggling with just the work and I had to make a decision, you know, to, to really like reevaluate and Piper Mandy, like I mentioned that professor helped me do that. And also I had like other friends outside of the CSULB campus too, that kind of chimed in my ear, but they were going to other colleges about, you know, about what I might like and what I might find for my passion. And again, like I didn't know, like there were other capacities in which you can help people. My only thing was like, that you know and so like somebody had mentioned hey you like sports why don't you try kinesiology I'm like dude that sounds like me right um so I ended up changing my major like four times I think the first time I changed it was to biology because again I did not want to you know leave those friendships I still wanted to keep those friendships so I changed to biology did that for a year that somebody was like hey try kin right went into kinesiology um, eventually I, those friendships ended up being parted ways. Some, some people actually end up not finishing and leaving Cal State Long Beach, you know, um, and some of them went in pharmaceuticals in the other direction too. So we ended up just like slowly like drifting apart. Um, and so I went to Ken, um, you know, I learned, um, when I was in there, I learned a thing called sports psychology. I was like, Hey, psychology and sports sounds like me, right? Because I had already that experience with psychology. So like when I was in the psych psych class with Piper Mandy, again, back to being a doctor, I, uh, my thing was, I'm going to be a psychologist, like a doctor of psychology, you know? So like, that's what I was thinking I was going to do. And already at that point, I had the information to know, like I had to get a higher level of education. Like I had to go through my master's and then my doctorate. And because my GPA suffered when I was in the, doing the biochem stuff and, you know, and I was thinking like, okay, maybe I can't go straight into a doctorate after undergrad which is some again like something as a first gen student I did not know anything like that so I was like kind of figuring out and you know at the same time identifying what my passion like my whole goal was for school was obviously to get a college degree and find my passion you know like find what I loved coming to work doing and like for five days a week at least 40 hours a day right and not hate what I'm doing like that was something that I didn't envision for myself you know so yeah I already knew that I was gonna go back to school you know and um and get a higher level of education and then I didn't learn about actual social work until I was in my other psych classes with that professor that was doing the meditation where like there's like this class that you take when you're a psych major where it basically introduces you to like all the um different careers within the psych um the psych field or the psych department you know and so then I learned about social work and I didn't even know that 
those people were considered therapists. Like, and then that's when I learned about marriage and family therapists and social workers. And, um, and I thought like that was an obvious stepping stone to being a psychologist. Like to me, it just logically made sense, you know? And so when I decided between social work and marriage and family therapists, I love the options that I could do with social work, what populations I can work with, you know, the different capacities that I can work with, whereas a marriage and family therapist like that would be my main role and I would only have to stick in that role. And so for me, it was all about options, going to school, having options, you know, like, so it just naturally fit with like my goals and wanting to like still have options and like what I can do and who it can work with. Like, hey, if like yeah, I get burned down in this area, I can always go here, you know, kind of thing. Um, again, I wanted a job that I didn't hate going to every day, you know? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I also learned like in psychology, like there wasn't a lot of things that you could do with just an undergrad. So I knew I had, I needed to get, get a master's to do the work that I believe that I was meant to do. Um, and, you know, so I believe that I achieved that goal with that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, with that, there is always that first step into the job, right? Um, you know, when you when you left the beach, what mm -hmm. was that like? What was that transition from student to working? And, you know, can you talk a little bit about that job? Yeah. Um, so I was okay, so in my last year. And like I said, I was on that five-year program. So in my last year, I was already thinking about having a job straight out of graduating. So I started to look into jobs in the mental health field uh, because like I said, like I wanted, I, I was thinking that's where I wanted to go, right? And I was like, let me get some experience and see if it's for me because um, the one thing, that you learn as you go to college is that you, although you might love the subject of what you're learning, how it plays out in the real world and the practicality of it might not be the same. Yeah. And so I think today, you know, we hear like people have often have jobs that they didn't even go to school for, you know, and so that so again, like I wanted to re-clarify and confirm like this was a fit for me. And so I ended up um getting a getting a job, a part-time job, because I was still in school. I ended up getting a part-time job on the weekends working in a in a psych hospital. Um and it, I was doing recreational therapy, which was like my kinesiology background. Yeah. Sounded you know? perfect. <laughs> and I again, like I I I can't explain anymore, like what manifestation and law of attraction and how just things play out, how they're, you know, like I, it's like above and beyond. And like, I get spiritual about it, you know? Um, so um, yeah, it was a per, you know, it was like a perfect opportunity for me to be exposed to this population, to working in the field, I, doing something related to like my kinesiology background, um, and, you know, it was a part-time gig. So it was an entry level, um, position. You didn't need a degree for it. Um, just some like experience and the supervisor that I had at the time was willing to give me that opportunity, which I was entirely grateful for, you know, I, and that job, I've learned so many things that are invaluable. It, that are were invaluable to me and my experience and then my success. Um, and so that's where I went. That's so then I wanted to get into that. So that way I could see like, Hey, is this for me? I went in, you know, it was really intimidating because like these, um, individuals are not stable. Like they come in with some suicidal ideation, maybe some attempts, you know, um, emotionally disturbed. Um, we even had like a specialized unit for those uh, individuals that were uh, developmentally disabled, meaning like they had maybe autism, a learning disability or something like that. 
Um, and then we also had both adolescents and adults. So I was exposed to all of that in just like one hospital. And so I was like, okay, like, you know, it was intimidating at first. It really was. I was really, I was really afraid. <laughs> a lot of the times I went into the units, uh, you know, cause I just, you just don't know what to expect. And like being, you know, you see things on TV, like you go back to like what you, what you experience with media, mainstream media and stuff like that. I mean, they don't portray mental health individuals in the brightest light, right? Like, and so, uh, you know, I go on thinking like, that's what my, that's what these people are going to look like, you know, and obviously that's not accurate, you know? Um, so, um, you know, that's what I did to prepare for me to have a job straight out of graduating Cal State Long Beach. And I made that transition from part-time to full-time. Once I graduated, um, a position opened up eventually and I overtook a position in a couple of the units and I became specialized and got a niche. Um, I was working with adolescents who were developmentally disabled who also had like an emer uh, emotional disturbance and still doing the same the same work groups, recreational therapy with them throughout the day. Um, it was amazing. I, I love working with kids honestly. So yeah, so that's that's how I navigated my transition. Obviously, I missed school, uh, but I was still living in Long Beach. I was still living in Long Beach, so I didn't feel that far away from, you know, the campus. I would pass by it almost every day, you know, or the activities and the events. My sister was also uh, still going to Cal State Long Beach at the time. Yeah, my sister followed in my footsteps. She went to Northridge at first, but I was like, dude, I don't know why you want to try to be different and go somewhere else. Like, you should just come with me until Long <laughs> Beach. Yes. <laughs> right. I'm like, it's, it's amazing, you know? And so she didn't have a very good experience in her first year of Northridge and she was able to transfer mid semester into Long Beach. I don't know how that happened, but she ended up coming to Long Beach with me. And so like, she was still like taking classes and stuff. So again, like I still didn't feel like uh, too far away. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, I mean, and, and, you know, that was, and that was your first job and, and that transition sounds almost like it was tailor-made for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, what was, what's the journey been like since? And how did you know it was time to move on from what at least seemed like a perfect fit at the time? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, I wanted to make myself more well-rounded when it came to working in this field because like I ended up loving the population I thought it was again like Tate like you said I think that was tailor-made for me and it just worked with my personality and just like again I wanted to help people and I felt like I was living my purpose you know and so of course like I knew that I was gonna come back for my master's at some point so I was like what's gonna help me be more well-rounded I thought it was important to like be well-rounded in um, the mental health field. So, and also I wanted to gain more responsibilities and a higher level of like, um, of knowledge. And so unfortunately, like at that hospital, I wasn't able to move in another direction um, to have those responsibilities uh, because it is like at, at the core of it, it's a hospital. So we had like nurses, we had doctors and stuff like that, that were the main ones on the unit. And there was just once an, um, an opportunity available to me where I could get a higher level and be more involved in like the treatment process and things like that. Um, so I started looking for other opportunities um, and I started learning about case management and being a case manager. Um, for those, for individuals with mental health diagnosis. And so I ended up taking, an, I ended up finding an opportunity to work in a full service partnership program. And the things about those is like, they're contracted with the Department of Mental Health. So it's a DMH contracted program um, for individuals who have a mental health diagnosis who are higher acuity, meaning like, they have their severity of their diagnosis is just under like being hospitalized. Um, they're like the most difficult to engage and to um, and to like 
just follow like follow things to like help them be more stable outside in the community. And so they they called the role, it was a mental health worker. So I was a mental health worker for a program for an FSP program in Pomona. It was called Tri-Cities Mental Health. And um, it was full service partnership. So it's outpatient. So basically the clients are living in the community and I'm going and helping provide services so they can be stable and also like, um, you know, work on their goals, hire, improve their well-being, improve their engagement with the community and things like that. I was working alongside with a therapist. So that was like another um, selling point for me because like that's the direction I was going. So I was like, okay, I can learn from them. I was also working with a nurse who would do the medication management, um, you know, a psychiatrist. I learned the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist, you know, I thought, they were the same thing until I went there. So a psychiatrist is the one that does the meds and basically is a medical doctor, you know, whereas a psychologist doesn't focus on that. Like their specialty is more towards like talk therapy and things like that. And so, um, so yeah, so I thought that was like also a great opportunity for me to like, again, like gain more skills, gain more knowledge, use the knowledge that I had in my hospital background to uh, instill and inspire changes and motivate uh, clients to improve their well-being so that's um that's what led that's what how I ended up with that and I thought it was gonna I believed it was gonna help like it was gonna help me um with my application towards grad school as well because I was gonna apply to grad school that's where I was applying to apply and it was like 2013 2014 at this point yeah yeah so you know you, you did get two different degrees at the beach so that that absolutely rocks and you know you mentioned that you had always felt that you would go back to get that higher degree um you know did that end up you know Sorry. accomplishing mm -hmm. accomplishing what you'd hoped and you know how did um the the skill set that you learned in in your advanced studies and even you know your 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 first degree at the beach how did that help you in your field and and what were those skills that you learned that you found are essential for your field yeah I think um with my undergrad um because I was a kin major I did a minor in psych so because I was a kin major I mean on like there are so many things that I learned in school that was just helpful for me just like in life you know when it came to like writing I know I mentioned that writing was not my strong point and while I was in my undergrad and all the experiences I, I it, it became a stronger point for me so even like in all my roles I've had to document and had I known we needed to do we and I didn't learn that it was so much documentation until I was actually in the role had I known maybe I would have chosen a different career honestly because I do so much writing and so much documentation and it, it's still not like my, my the thing that I love to do I'm great at it now you know but it was not like something that I like to do but anyways you know yeah you know, I learned about how to be more of an effective writer you know it's really taught me to be resilient and you don't know, ask questions just to be a student at life you know like I think if being a student was a career I'd be a lifetime student honestly <laughs> and so you know, just to be a student in life and always ask questions and be curious, right? The scientific method of things, like that's what my undergrad taught me. It was like, just to be, continue with your curiosity and that's how you're gonna gain the most knowledge. Um, and then also obviously the information that I learned, the knowledge that I learned about like, you know, the different mental health stuff, like the different diagnoses, how they come about, you know, like the etymology of like genes and like how that plays out. You know, I think biology was like very helpful in helping me understand like, how does it even come about? You know, like how does mental health even happen? How does somebody become, you know, with this illness or this disturbance and things like that? And, um, you know, just to give it more context and things like that. So, yeah, I think um, it really prepared me for that, for that part. And, um, and it really helped me with that. And then also, you know, like, um, 
I think I gained like some other information, you know, from my colleagues that I was and my coworkers that I was working with and things like that um, about like tips and tools and tricks, you know, yeah. and to be a resource and to use my resources also too. like I've learned at Cal State Long Beach how to utilize all the resources that they have, like the tutoring center and things like that. Like I utilize almost everything at Long Beach just because I just. I really needed support in that way. And I'm so glad that I had that support, you know? Yeah. And learn that skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. learn that skill. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what would you say um, in, in your current job and your current position in, in the whole case management field, um, what would you say is the most challenging part of your job? Uh, yeah, let's see. The most challenging part of my job, since like now I am a super in a supervisory role, so most of my stuff is admin and um, overseeing personnel. I think that's like the most challenging is like um, motivating, giving feedback to my case managers. Um, also like working within the interdisciplinary team because like we all have um, different perspective and lens from which we operate and we have to you have to reel all that in towards one goal which is like the success and overall being of the client so it's a lot of liaisoning problem solving you know compromising on like let's do it a different way let's do it her way let's do it his way you know kind of thing um and, um, you know, the quality assurance part of it, um, again, now, instead of like motivating and inspiring uh, clients or participants, I now motivate and inspire case managers, you know, to um, do their job as effectively, you know, as humanely with a client-centered perspective as we can, you know, so I think that's like my most the most challenging part because I'm working with individuals who have dis different personalities, different life experiences, different traumas, you know, even in work traumas that they've had. So like a lot of time um, having to like weave through all those things, you know, um, so that way we stay on the same page and work towards the overall goal. You know, and sometimes I end up just being a therapist <laughs> in some of my in some of my meetings just to like again like facilitate and liaison the different perspective and lens and validate and encourage and you know re um re inspire like hey this is for the client you know so I think that's like the most challenging part of my role which I love because like that's what I loved about um you know, being direct service social worker too is working with individuals with different personalities and, you know, finding what works for them. Well, and then, you know, it, it might be the same answer, but then what would you say is the most rewarding part of your job? Yeah, that is the most rewarding part <laughs> of the job is when we, when there is a successful collaboration, when there is a success amongst the clients, you know, and the rapport you build, like you really build a connection and a rapport with your clients uh, because the work is just so intimate and personal, you know, and um. And it's, it's full of emotion, you know, cause we're humans with emotions and we're having emotional relationships. Um, and so that is like the most reported, uh, rewarding part is seeing a client that you never thought would succeed or maybe never even succeeded in anything in their life, like succeed at, at, at this, you know, succeed at, and being stable on their own and being independent and self-sufficient and a contributing member of society, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, um, you know, I, it's just, it's, it, it can really like bring tears to my eyes. Like some of the things that I've seen and experienced with, with my clients and how they see and experience with me. Cause some of the, my clients like do want to keep a relationship with you, even when they leave, or graduate the program, or when you leave, you know, to another job, um, and just, you know, just having that connection, and that support, 
Um, cause a lot of the times, you know, these clients really don't have it in their own lives, you know, so it's something that's really special to them and they want to keep close. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I can never, I can never believe it, <laughs> but, uh, we are coming close to our time with the chat today. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so with that, I, I want to ask you, um, you know, what what advice would you give to someone, a, a beach student, who is looking perhaps at this career field, right? Yeah. Looking at social work. Um, wh what either, you know, tips or tricks or li big life advice or practical mm -hmm. interview advice or, or any, any or all of the above. Um, what would you say to someone who's looking to enter this field? I would say, first off, be prepared to attain a higher level of education, like a master's or doctorate straight up, um, because that's the only way you're going to be able to do this work, you know, in the real world is with one of those levels, um, you know, and then, you know, if you already know that you want to be a social worker, like they have advanced standing. So like if you do your undergrad, which again, I didn't know until like afterwards, right? That if you do have a bachelor's in social work, you can be eligible to do an advanced standing for a master's. So instead of doing the two years, you do the one year and boom, you're a master's level social worker. So like, had I known back in the back, I probably, I would have done that, you know, just like, cause it's just faster and you want to get done and you want to do your, you want to, you know, work in your purpose. So that's like one for sure, a game changer. The next one I would say is like really get comfortable being uncomfortable, like practice emotion, emotional regula regulation, self-regulation, you know, like that was the advice that we got in the MSW program, like first day, get comfortable being un uncomfortable. And it's just because it's the nature of the work. Like you're gonna be in uncomfortable situations like almost every day, like whether that's like sitting in awkward silence with your client on the way to a court, you know, or on the way to um, a medical evaluation where they're waiting to hear like whether or not they have cancer or something like that, you know? So like um, those are some of the things that you will experience. Um, and so, that's an important thing, you know, and again, back to like emotions or and feelings are sometimes like not a comfortable thing for us. Like a lot of us struggle with feelings and emotions and push them to the side, you know, and so like sometimes you'll have clients crying in front of you and it can be very uncomfortable, you know, like just experiencing that or like being like, oh my gosh, what should I do now? Or somebody telling you like their father just passed away and you're like sitting in that grief is like uncomfortable, you know? So like, that's like the other advice I would give. And then also like the third one would be like being patience, being patient is essential. Like it's so mm -hmm. important. I, that's another reason why I think I fit so well into this field because I'm a very patient person, um, just naturally. And then having an open mind, like I mentioned, I work with different personalities, you know, different perspectives and stuff like that, different agendas, you know, and patience and having an open mind it comes in clutch in those moments when there's struggle. Awesome. Well, thank you. And, you know, great, great advice to for, for folks who are interested in entering the field. I think very practical advice. Mm -hmm. um, but also just thank you so much for your time today. I think that this chat has been really informative and just a great slice of, you know, your journey and, and what a journey into the field could look like. So thank you so much for taking the time today. Awesome. Thank you, Jenna. I enjoyed it. Yeah, awesome. Well, so for all of you who have joined us today, I want to say thank you so much as well. Um, I, we encourage you to follow us at csulb.edu slash alumni. Uh, you can also follow us on social media to stay up to date with, uh, you know, what we're doing. Make sure that you don't miss the next industry chat. Uh, and that handle is uh, at CSULB alumni. So pretty simple. Um, but Krista, if folks were interested in continuing this conversation with you, or maybe had some additional questions about uh, a career in social work, mm -hmm. uh, how might they get in touch with you? Yeah, my LinkedIn. I mean, honestly, you could Google me. 
<laughs> and you know, my LinkedIn will be like probably one of the first things that come up. So uh, I don't know my actual like tag name for my LinkedIn, but yeah, just look me up by my name and in LinkedIn and I'll pop up. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And again, thank you all so much for joining us today. Have a great one. Goodbye.